Well, hello and welcome to our uh, national video call. And once again, as we're trying to do every other week, uh, just present to you the answers to the questions that you have for us, real-time things happening in the market. And of course, this particular period happens to be in line with what was one of the most volatile weeks of the market last week, which followed the uh, biggest down day of the year, which was that half day uh, after Thanksgiving. So between end of the year stuff, the Fed, uh, market volatility, the COVID moment, the fact that as we're sitting here recording right now, the uh, market happens to be up, up 700 points. And last week we had up and down days every day, but all of it speaks to the fact we're in obviously a volatile time in markets. And so we imagine those things on your mind and I'm here to answer those things. And to do so, I brought in my very favorite interviewer, Scott Gam from Strategy Voice Communications, who as he always does is gonna capably lead us in a dialogue um, if you can't tell, I'm not in my normal studio, and so we'll be keeping it short here today because I'm getting ready to jump on a flight, and so uh, hopefully we'll give you something succinct and useful as you think about the investing environment we're in. Scott, uh, you can ask me anything you want. I am all yours. Well, David, thank you, and we will make sure that you don't miss your flight, but great to be with you as always. And David, let's start off, obviously, with, with some of the market action we've been seeing over the past couple of weeks. Very volatile, as you said, but we're still not too far off from all-time highs reached a few weeks ago. A lot of uncertainty around the Omicron variant. What are your thoughts, uh, to your point, as we sit here with a Dow that's up 700 points? I'm, uh, I'm pretty firmly of the opinion that there's a lot less uncertainty than, than people might have thought. And, and even when there was more uncertainty, uh, like a week and a half ago, that responding to uncertainty with a certain response is quite irrational. And so, um, you know, when you hit the sell button well, around uncertain news, you've done something certain. And, and yet it was in response to something uncertain. And I don't think that that is generally a very wise thing for investors to do. But then now, what do I mean by the fact that we're getting more certainty? Um, in the DC today, today, uh, the Monday, December 6th edition, which by the way, a little trivia for people, this will be the longest edition of the DC Today that we have ever had. Um, there is a lot of uh, medical updates that have come about. You know, I was blown away by the World Health Organization's update last night that there is not a single fatality in the world from this variant. I had thought that there was very light severity so far, very minimal hospitalization, but you know some percentage of cases that result in, in, resulted in death. And there has not been a single death, not only here in the United States, but even in South Africa, where the infections have been growing more, uh, more you know, exponentially. So um, <clears throat> the genetic sequencing that I unpack in DC today, and that there was a great deal of research done over the last 10 days on, has basically got to the bottom of this. And there's obviously new information can come, new things can be discovered. So we respond to what we know, not what we don't know. But effectively it appears that the host here that had COVID-19 for this variant mutation, um, that the other blend was the same coronavirus that is essentially what we refer to as the common cold. And so the uniqueness of this is a, is a COVID mixed with a cold There has not been a mutation yet that had that same variant and uh, that, that blended with the cold. And so if you were to say two things about this variant so far, which is, yeah, it seems really infectious, sounds like very contagious, sounds like a cold, and it's really not very severe, sounds like a cold. It's all starting to make sense when it is a cold. And that's what we're dealing with. And so the market is uh, now unwinding a lot of the irrationality of the last week. And uh, hopefully somewhere in there, some people learn a lesson. Uh, and of course, we'll be watching over the coming weeks to see, uh, you know, maybe from some of the vaccine makers as to how effective our current vaccines are against this new strain. But David- uh, But by I the way, Scott, I want to point something out. Let's say that they're not. Um, then this strain becomes a vaccine in a sense because it gets spread and puts uh, antibody- into people without killing them or hospitalizing them. And so you, in a sense, get uh, an additional level of immunization at some degree, which I admit is not fully known, but you get some greater immunization 
um, uh, for people with or without a prior vaccination that just simply adds to the protection in the society. And so unless this thing turns more severe, the vaccine's in if, uh, assumed lack of efficacy against this or minimal efficacy against um, contracting it does, means nothing. And so because people are going to get something that goes away as a cold. So I really do think that, um, that there's a chance this turns into very good market news because you've had a percentage of people that have had a vaccine hesitancy and to the degree that there ends up being spread from this that creates greater antibody protection, eventually we see higher T cell immunization and then, and then of course combated with additional vaccinations that, that have had a, a increasing penetration, you just get a, a greater protection. Probably never foolproof, probably never zero COVID, which seems to be you know, the uh, continually abandoned policy approach for I think very good reason. But I just wanted to point out that if the vaccine proves to um, not stop people from contracting this variant, and yet this variant proves to be a common cold, um, I, I don't know that you could get a better outcome. Uh, David, let's also talk about the, the volatility we're seeing in the markets, because you've also said that, and, and it's clear just from the performance of the market so far this year, that the market really hasn't been that volatile this year, even though we have been experiencing volatility over the past couple of trading sessions and weeks. Could you square that for us in terms of people following the market now might think that there's volatility, but we, we've actually had a, a pretty quiet market this year. Yeah, and so that, that's the way I'd square it is by sharing both of those facts as simultaneously true, that we have had a very low volatility year, and then we've had this one vol uh, higher volatility week. Um, but within the context of the full year, the intra-year highs and lows are incredibly low volatility, even factoring in last week where the S&P never even did get to a 5% drawdown. And uh, now you have S&P and Dow that haven't even had a 6% drawdown uh, going back a year and a half. It's just unheard of. I mean, it's incredibly rare. When I say unheard of, in 2017, the market never went down more than 2.9% at any point from a high to a low. But that was the lowest volatility year in the history of the market. And, and so we're, we're in all things considered, relatively speaking, a very low volatility year. But I acknowledge within a week, having a minus 900 point day, um, a couple of point uh, plus 600 point days, and then a couple of minus 400 and 600 point days, all of that back and forth on a point basis is more volatile on a percentage basis, not so much. Um, but still the, um, the reality is that we have a point coming Scott. And now this appears to be the sixth time in which it was, is not this time that the market will really correct something more in the range of let's say eight to 14%. Um, and we haven't had that for a very long time. And David, also, we should point out when you look under the hood, there are many names, many individual stocks that are in correction territory, bear market territory. So perhaps the story is a little bit different when you look, you know, in the weeds of the market versus just at the index level. Yeah, Scott, I'm so glad you brought that up. I really appreciate it because it's a very important point. Just as last year on the upside, there was a lot of companies that were um, down over 20%. And the market at one point was only down about 7%. And it was the largest delta we'd ever seen between the cap weighted market and the even weighted market. And, and let me find a simpler way to say this. <clears throat> the blended market, because of outperformance from larger issues, was reflecting a better index result than the average company in the S&P was. And, and right now, you most certainly do have a market uh, that is not down anywhere near as much as a lot of the most popular holdings from last year are. And so this is where there could very well out there be a high dispersion of results of what investors are facing. Some people may have a general feeling of an incredibly good year. Most people probably have a feeling of a good year or better. And then there might be some that are actually starting to feel like it's not a good year. Um, this is another thing that will be in DC today, today that I have to share with you. 
small cap growth is down on the year now, 2%. It had been up about 25%. Large cap growth is up 21%. That delta between large cap growth and small cap growth is absolutely unheard of. So the question is, does small cap growth just bounce back and come back to where its large cap growthy counterparts are? Or is the risk reward skewed to what I would suspect is that large cap growth comes down to meet its small cap growth brethren? That's my suspicion, but it's a very interesting dispersion because you have rather healthy double digit returns in large cap growth large cap value and small cap value. So the value cousins, large and small cap have done just fine, but then it's the small cap growth that has led this way down where there was lower quality, where there was higher PE ratios, where there was a significant amount of, of different risk factors. Where do we go from here? How do you get those quadrants to kind of come revert to some sort of normal historical relationship? I think the most likely scenario would be large cap growth coming down, but who knows? But um, these are important market metrics to understand. David, also want to get your thoughts on oil. Uh, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, maybe even a month ago, obviously oil was a lot higher than it was now, just under $70 a barrel right now. Uh, do we go back up to the 80s or, you know, kind of yeah. where does all this vol market volatility put oil? Yeah, I don't know. I hope we don't go back to the 80s. But um, the fact that it came down to the low 60s last week and bounced back so violently to the high 60s without really much news is just a testimony to the continued supply demand realities. The OPEC plus uh, cartel is continuing with their planned production increases, which you could argue is either bullish or not for supply. They're increasing production, but they're not increasing production more than they've already said they were going to be increasing production for almost a whole year now. And so I, I think that um, some of the little gimmick things going on about the, um, the uh, emergency reserves uh, and so forth are pretty immaterial. Uh, becomes more of a demand factor. It, you know, we're, the supply is not going to get up high enough to offset the demand that is assumed in pricing if demand meets there, if demand ends up materializing to that degree. That leads me to a 65 to 75 window, but not a 75 to 85 window. And the only way I think you get to a 55 to 65 window is if you um, do in fact having very disappointing demand. It doesn't seem to be in the cards right now. Well, David, I think that's a good place to wrap our conversation for today is uh, we wanna make sure you make your flight, but I'll toss back to you. Uh, with any final comments and thanks for your insights as always and safe travels. Well, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I think, I think we covered the basics there. I appreciate that. A couple uh, interesting things to note in the way markets are shaping up, the high dispersion of results that allow us to have a conversation that has been very, very rare for about 13 years now, which is on dispersion of results. It's a market conversation that is not about all risk on versus all risk off. And so underneath the hood right now, markets, you're seeing uh, what I suspect would be early innings of a period that is very different, where there is certain risks that are on and certain risks that are off. Um, the, the issue with this variant, you know, as I wrote about in Dividend Cafe on Friday, and it was one of my favorite Dividend Cafes I've written in a while because it's, an, it's a point that's so important to me, that oftentimes people just want you to either say, is it going to be good or is it going to be bad? And when you say the thing that people think is going to be bad is going to be good, but there's another thing that's going to be bad that we got to talk about, it, it's nuanced. And that is so rare in our public discourse, even in financial conversation. But that's my view right now. I want people to be focused on where risks are, which is high valuation, bubble-like craze type mentality and vocabulary and, and behavior. And then thirdly is Fed distortions. Those to me represent very meaningful conversations and very meaningful things to express in one's portfolio, which of course is what I think we do quite vigorously at the Bonson Group. Uh, but to the extent that people want to talk about the worry of more infections and so forth on the COVID deal and this variant coming up, um, I really do believe it's been a week of some of the most shameful media coverage. And, and in some cases, not many, 
but in some cases, some uh, policymaker things that were just wildly irrational. Uh, we had plenty of wild irrationality in, in prior months, but this, this one didn't get too bad. Most people kind of waited to see, and now what they're seeing looks a lot better. Investors would be wise to, to learn from that mentality. So that's where we are. Uh, a lot of challenges as we come into the end of the year to prepare for next year. I'm going to keep covering them every day at the dctoday.com, whether you're a client or not. I'm going to keep covering them every, every week in dividendcafe.com, whether you're a client or not. But I'm going to really be covering them in your portfolio if you are a client. Scott, thanks for everything. And we will go ahead and adjourn here. And uh, we welcome your questions anytime at questions at the Take care.